Hey there, Canonites. Welcome back to Halo Canon. Today we're out, we're doing the answer section of the Q and A thing. <laughs> um, this is I know this might be getting a bit cliche, but I want to apologize right now for the delay in this. Um, simple answer is I've been trying to record it, and either my camera, for no reason that I can figure, has just decided eh, I don't want to. Or the footage is getting cut off at weird at weird spots. So here's to hoping this particular one doesn't screw up. Um, anyway, so got a lot of exciting questions that I cannot wait to, to answer. Um, so let's get right into this. Uh, and apologies in advance if I butcher your name. Just letting you know. Uh, Dark Skull Elite thir or Dark Skull thirteen thirty seven asks. What do you think about mendicant bias possibly appearing in Halo 5, taking into account the terminals from Halo 3 and the epilogue audio file on Waypoint for Silentium? Thank you. No, thank you. Um, but no, in all seriousness, uh, it's entire. It is highly probable. I think there is no doubt in my mind that mendicant bias is going to appear in Halo 5. I mean, all us lore freaks, you know, we're, we're very confident that we're going to the Ark. That's what it looked like in the trailer. There's not much to go on, but it definitely seems to be the case. Um, 343 has been building up the precursors through the Forerunner saga and the Flood, so it looks like the Flood's in for a return. Um, in which case, you know, if the Flood are returning, who do you want to go to? Who's the the resident Flood expert at this point? Medican Bias. Maybe Humanities doesn't know that, but, you, you know, they, 343 can, can find a way to get all that going. I mean, at the very least, uh, we know humanity knows about the terminals, so they probably know about mendicant bias, and they obviously, you know, Oni at the very least, you know, all the books, uh, all the Forerunner books are basically, uh, you know, reconstructions of, you know, various artifacts or, or things that Oni found. Uh, mostly it looks like on Trevelyan, but, um, or sorry, I know I butchered that name. But uh, either on the shield installation, the Onyx shield installation, or in the case of Primordium, you know, 343 Guilty Spark slash Chakas. Anyway, um, in addition to that, we have a character known as Petra showing up in Halo Escalation. Now, for those who don't know, Petra was a character from and one of the adjunct sections of, it was either Fall of, Fall of Reach or First Strike, the reprints. So... And and she what she you know what what points what, what the whole clue with her is that she kind of figured that she found Cortana's message to John that we see in Halo Three about the Ark having a solution to the flood without firing the remaining Halo rings and the way she fi or or what she figures is well you know firing this replacement ring technically doesn't mean they had to re fire the remaining rings to stop the flood but was that actually what Cortana was talking about and this is something a lot of fans have speculated on it too. So with Petra showing up, it does seem to indicate we might be going back to the Ark, if all the pieces that we seem to have fit together as we predict. Um, Steeliest asks, how old is John 117, or 117? I don't know why I said 117. Uh, John 117 is 46 years old at the, start of Halo, uh, at the start of Halo 4. He was born on March 7th in 2511. All Spartan 2s were born in 2511. So... Yeah. Uh, what is John's home planet? Um, Eridanus or Eridanus, I'm actually not sure, but I'm pretty sure it's Eridanus. Uh, Eridanus 2. Uh, do you watch Machinima? If so, what is your favorite? Um, I used to watch a lot of Machinima. I used to go to machinima.com every day and watch all the new stuff or I'd subscribe to their you know YouTube channel. I'm still subscribed, but um, you know I mostly go for... I don't know, sometimes gaming news, I don't really watch them that much anymore. But, you know, back in the day, watch Sprigs, uh, Gears of Halo Theft Auto, Inside Halo, back when that was still a thing. For those who don't know, Inside Gaming started as Inside Halo. So, yeah, that was, you know, way back when, way back when Halo 3 came out. Um, which is strange to say, it's seven, almost seven years. Today will be, this, or this year will be the seven-year anniversary of Halo 3. But, um... No, what was the other thing I was thinking about? Um, Spriggs, Gears of Halo Theft Auto, uh, the Codex, one of my favorites up there. If you haven't checked out the Codex, and it does have a couple prequels and sequels. And I think the group that did it is actually still doing some stuff. I think they're doing like a live action thing now, or they did do a live action thing, something like that. 
I got back into it, but I couldn't remember. I don't remember all the details. Um, and there are so there are just there are so many more uh, pregame lobby and matchmaking both come to mind. <laughs> um, I think pregame lobby actually is still going on. It went on through Reach at the very least, um, so it might still be going on. But these days, I pretty much just watch Red versus Blue. It's my it was always my favorite. Hard to argue why you know it, it's easy to see why. Jumped on that bandwagon bandwagon um, back in high school, and I've been riding it ever since. Can't wait for season twelve, right? Anyway, Kellett ninety four asks, "How do you how do you make a souffle?" Actually, Kell Kellett ninety four and Kellel ask, "How do you make a souffle?" Google, Google is how you make a souffle. They have an app on Android phones. Instant stuf, instant souffle, or Doctor Who. Doctor Who is a good way to make a souffle too. Um, Bradley Meyer asks, "What do you think Halo Five needs to be a solid game like Halos One, Two, or Three? I'm not saying Halo Four is bad, but it wasn't on the tier of the others. Also, what do you think of a release date push to 2515? Is it good? Is it a good thing? And why?" So what does Halo 5 need to be a solid game like Halos 1, 2, or 3? Well, campaign-wise, you know, story-wise, story -wise, at least campaign, um, I think 343 is pretty solid. I loved Halo 4's story. Yeah, I could probably get a few kinks out here, here and there, but honestly, what Halo what Halo game's story was absolutely perfect. ODST. <coughs> ODST. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's cough there for a second. Um... But, you know, they need to bring back metagame scoring uh, for sure. Um, you know, there was something else I was talking about with some friends, and I can't, can't remember what it is for the life of me. But that was the big one, metagame scoring. Um, oh, this is kind of a minor thing, and it has to do – this isn't really – this is like – all Halo as a, in general, they had this in ODST and it hasn't really returned since. Achievement counters, I don't know how the rest of the community feels about that, but you know, um, achievements that say you know get X amount of something on whatever, that would be a it would be nice if you had an achievement counter for that, but that's a minor thing. Um, but no, for Halo Five to actually succeed, let's continue on. Um, match for matchmaking. Uh, Active true skill at all times. Whether this means uh, visible uh, skill ratings or not is, you know, not. That's not really something I. You know, I'm not really big on that, but I can understand the appeal of it. But at the very least, if it's not visible, or you know, not visible in game, uh, it needs to be active in the background from day one. Uh, you know, be you know, even if we get a return to ranked and social. You know, social needs to have um, true skill working in the background, or you know, um, strict true skill, true skill, which means you know, finding players within a within your skill range. Because it's no fun to go up against a bunch of, uh, you know, there's no fun in Halo Three to go a bunch a bun, up a bunch a bunch of generals. <laughs> Eating my, you know, starting my words there, um, which that happened to me in ranked too, but that's that's another discussion. Um, and it's no fun going up against a bunch of people that are less skilled than you. That's just cheap. But um, if we decide, if if three four three decides to go back to a skill rating system like Halo Two or Halo Three, for one thing, it cannot be it cannot be treated like a leveling system. Halo Two's was Halo Three's, especially when it was directly linked to a progression system. Um, those two systems do not work in tandem. They are they are polar opposites. Um, but anyway, though you know, if that returns, they, they need there needs to be a separation between skill rating and um, progression rank rank. Uh, let's see. For custom games, you know, bring back all the classic game types uh, as many as possible: invasion, VIP, race. Um, and you know, uh, shoot, what were some of the other ones? Uh, assault, proper assault needs to come back. Not ricochet. Not some of the variants that have been created in Oddball. Proper assault. Um, I'd personally like to see territories come back, but you could always make you could always you know you could kind of file Dominion as as something of a territories type game. It it's very similar, 
But, you know, bring it back as many classics as you can. And now, I, I have to comment, you know, Halo 4, the reason it had so few is basically how to... Is it's it has to do with how the engine stores game type data in in Halo One, Two, and Three. They were built straight into the engine. Um, with Halo Reach, Bungie tried a new at a new system where it was basically like a separate subroutine or a separate engine of sorts that stored all this game type data, and that has to do with why you know they could they could add game types later on. Why Three Four Three can currently add new game types and options um, after release. But because of that new system, when 343 took over, I guess they just weren't too familiar with it, and or it also had to do with all these changes they wanted to do. So it just didn't really it worked out to lesser game types. But you know now that 343 is familiar with everything and seen you know with all the with the game types that keep coming in, it seems like we should be able to get a pretty damn good selection at launch. Um. And of course, you know, bring back, bring as much customization as possible. You know, CTF, give us the option to turn on or off the flagnum, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm really hoping firefight returns. That would definitely be um, a big thing for you know a lot of people love firefight. I know I love firefight. It would be a big thing to boost popularity with Halo Four. Now, if they do bring it back, they got to bring it back. They got to bring it back. The options that Reach had at minimum. But it has to have the challenge, again, at minimum. I'd honestly like to see some innovation, you know, who wouldn't? But at minimum, it needs to be as challenging as ODSTs. ODS, what's nice about Firefight with ODST, it wasn't just another, you know, horde mode or survival. It had a, it, it had a unique Halo take on it. You know, you had the rounds, which each had their own skulls, and then you had individual sets, which had their own skulls, at least up to set five. In which case, afterwards, it became repetitive. But, you know, that set thing disappeared in Halo Reach for reasons I don't know. It needs to come back. And honestly, if, if 343 can can add some, some some you know, more depth, additional depth, <laughs> um, some additional additions, some optional options, um, you know, the more the better with it. Um, and then I, if Spartan Ops returns, which... I'm not quite sure that they will bring it back. It doesn't look like they will. You know, it, it was a fun experiment for Halo 4, but I don't know if they're really up to that. Which actually, that kind of brings me back to campaign for a moment. Um, you know, instead of Spartan Ops, maybe um, side campaigns. You know, if uh, you know, have your main 10, 15 hour campaign about the Chief, and then have some side campaigns, maybe about Spartan 4s or the Arbiter. But yeah. Um, if Spartan Ops comes back, uh, for one thing, I don't like the fact that I didn't like the fact that the individual missions. You know, every every week you had um, a new episode, and then you had five missions. I don't like that the missions. You know, you had to go back to the menu to reselect a new, the next mission. You should. Do, I think you, it should be like levels in the campaign where you just go to each one without interruption. Um, skulls need to be skull options needs to come in. Um, Meta game scoring needs to come in, and probably leaderboards. I, I I would love leaderboards for Spartan Ops, um, but the big thing is three four three needs to take chances, needs to make to take risks with Spartan Ops. They kind of started doing that in, in the second half of season one, but you know really really take those big risks. You know try out some stealth missions, do some more dogfighting missions, uh, try out ideas that you you wouldn't normally want to take a risk with campaign because you know camp there's a certain thing that certain things that campaign needs you know to use it spartan ops as an experimenting ground to find out what sort of missions halo players are going to like and that can that can be used to improve later halo games um i don't really want to too, touch too much on forge because i don't know a whole lot about it but you know make make forge better <laughs> that's pretty much what i got Jake Mega asks, do you believe that there's any potential in making Halo's uh, multiplayer canon? Do you think it should return, and how do you feel about uh, your Spartan being a canonical character? Well, to start, your, the Spartans, your Spartans are not canonical characters. Um, they're just an avatar in the Halo universe, much like the Chief was in Halo CE. But they, uh, they are not canon at, in, any, in any form. They're, like three, they're about 300 or so Spartan to, or sorry, Spartan 4s on Infinity and 
you know, an unknown number possibly active in other parts of the galaxy. But, you know, their, their numbers are limited. Pro I doubt it goes much over 500, certainly not over 1,000. So not the, you know, not the 20, 30,000 that are playing Halo 4 every day. But as for story potential for making the uh, multiplayer canon, there's not a whole lot. I do want to see it return because I thought it was a nice, you know, nice little twist. And for the most part, it's more about Easter eggs and like nods to, to the multiplayer fan base. Like, you know, in Halo Escalation, the first issue is starts out with Sarah Palmer playing Invasion. That was a nice nod to Halo Reach and the multiplayer fans. Um, in Halo 4's campaign, the level Shutdown, there you can you can actually find you know the the multiplayer announcer, uh, or you can find like the area that's supposed to lead to the war games section of the ship. But you know if you hit the right button, you get the multiplayer announcer saying "War Games Shut Down" and stuff along those lines. And you cannot access, you know. So it's more about that. Not so, but you never know. There could be ways to really work in um, a a really good story with it. So I do hope it returns. Um, Ryan Barshik asks, The Halo community isn't as big as it used to be. Do you think it will ever regain its popularity? Though I do like it smaller, it was cool when everyone used to play. Um, I don't think it will. the, the uh, Halo community will ever be as big as it used to be. Um, not so much because of the changes that... that have come to Halo, but mostly because of the gaming market as it is today. If you go to Wikipedia, search, you know, 2007 in video games, 2008, 2010, 2013 in video games, and just look at the number of video games that are releasing every day, or every week, I should say. Um, you know, 2007, we've had maybe 100 games released over the course of that year. These days, we're getting you know, a hundred games in the first quarter of the year. We're getting like major releases every week, two to three major releases a week. I'm talking like midnight opening releases a week. And, you know, back during, you know, back during Halo 2 and Halo 3's days, those were like the, Halo was practically the only game there was. You know, sure, around the time of Halo 3, there was also Call of Duty, which was immensely popular. But, you know, it was before the current COD boom. And, you know, th those were basically the only two games you could go to if you wanted to be social with, with people, if you wanted to, you know, play with friends online. These days we have, like, you know, the party chat system where I can be playing Mass Effect, my buddy can play, be playing Skyrim, but we can still have a conversation and interact with each other in some ways. That really, that, that, infrastructure really didn't exist at that time so you had to be playing multiplayer of some kind if you wanted to interact with friends on xbox live so it was more about accessibility i suppose is the word i'm looking for so i don't think it i don't think it'll ever regain its popularity but i don't think that's necessarily a fault of halo like you could re-release halo like a halo game that strips away all these new additions since halo reach is you know pure Halo Two slash Halo Three with maybe a couple additions to make it unique, and I can almost guarantee that you would not see the population that we saw back in two thousand seven or two thousand nine when I think Halo like really reached its peak. Um, moving on, Big John Big John Metal asks, "What do you think the Arbiter's role in the next Halo game will be?" Um, Honestly, I don't think he's going to be a character like Halo 2 or 3, you know, where in Halo 2 you were switching between him and the Chief, or Halo 3, he became the second player when you had co-op. But I do think he's going to be featured um, as a strong, like a Johnson character or something, you know, important side character. Um... But yeah, I mean, what I would like, what I personally like to see is he get, you know, you have your ten, like I was saying before, you have your 10, 15 hour chief campaign, and then maybe three hour arbiter campaign where he's doing, where you find out what he's doing while the chief's doing his stuff. Um, but that's about as far as I see. I would love to see you know arbiter come in and uh, take on Jewel with uh, along with the chief. That'd be pretty badass because you know the arbiter would win. 
Um, do you think there is any potential for an emotional meetup when the Chief has to confront Halsey, or do you think that they will write her alliance with Jewel out with a lame cop out? Um, potential for emotional for emo, for an emotional meetup? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, just look at what happened what happened with Halsey when she found out John was alive in Spartan Ops, and um, I'm sure the Chief, you know, is is been is eager to see Halsey too, especially. You know, after after Reach, you know, or um, after she disappeared with Leia, because the last time he saw her was when she disappeared with Kelly in Ghost of Onyx. So I'm sure I'm sure he wants to know what's up. <laughs> um, I don't think they'll write her. I mean, you have to understand this about the alliance. She the the alliance she has with Jewel. She, Halsey is the way I see it. She is kind. Of, she's playing the long game. She's allying with Jewel. Only because it is what currently suits her best. It is the be is the best of you know. It's making the best of a bad situation. Because um, she if she doesn't ally with him, she just gets killed most likely. Uh, no skin no skin off Jules back. But ultimately, the way I see the way I see her alliance, uh, it's a temporary one, and she's you know she's playing it close to the vest. She. And you know maybe she want, she actually does want revenge, but it would be on Oni or or Sarah Palmer and and Osmond specifically, maybe even Lasky. But does she want to destroy humanity like Jewel does? Absolutely not. So I'm going to be interested to see exactly what three four three does, but I don't think they're just going to cop out of it. Um, also, what do you think they'll do with Cortana? Will she be born uh, born as a uh, born as a human through the composer? No. Or will the chief get her back, with, but at the cost of her memories, uh, memories, past feelings towards John, essentially a blank slate, uh, essentially a blank slate for a sort of bittersweet reunion. Um, I do think she is permanently gone. She might, you know, there, there's some ways you could uh, figure out to kind of write her back in, and so, like not in, not as a full blown comeback but maybe you know fragments of her in some forerunner tech or even some fragment of her that survives in john's suit in john's mjolnir um but ultimately she is gone and she's absolutely not coming back through the composer um i've been i've hated this idea ever since it first popped up you know after halo 4 came out uh the forerunners couldn't even figure out how to get a, a a person who had been digitized by the composer back into be in, into an organic body without severe side effects. And hell, even the composed bot, you know, composed minds had some pretty bad side effects um, without being turned back into human. So, um, yeah, she's not coming back. She's not gonna. And we're talking with Cortana. We're talking about a personality that never was human. Yeah, she's based on Halsey's brain, but Cortana herself was never human. Um, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh yeah, the other thing is, if three four three brought her back, it would just cheapen the story of Halo Four. And I mean, it was incredibly brave for them to kill her off like they did, and to bring it back to bring her back would would. Just cheapen her, cheapen the story of Halo Four, and make her sacrifice meaningless. So it, it'd be like bringing Johnson back in any way, shape, or form. Never Tech asks, "What is your favorite moment in Halo ever?" <laughs> Ooh, this is an exciting one. My favorite moment is from the impossible life and possible death of Preston J. Cole. The short story from Halo Evolutions and the final entry in the Halo universe, at least thus far, by Eric Nyland. Near the end, Cole is taking on an entire Covenant armada. His ship, he's evacuated his ship, so it's just him. And what does he do to take out this Covenant armada? He ignites a brown dwarf. He ignites a star to take them out. I mean... That is so epic. <laughs> oh, God. When I first read that and imagining that in my head, you know, if 343 ever 
adapts a um, Halo, uh, Halo Evolution story to a motion comic again. I want to see the Impossible Life and Impossible Death of Preston J. Cole just to see him blow take out an arm a Covenant Armada with a sun. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Andrew McCarthy asks, "Do you think we will see more species in Halo?" Decepticon Cobra asked about this on White Point a while ago, and I hope to, I hope we see more. Honestly, I think the the chances of that are very are slim to none. Um, well, obviously, I hopefully we'll see more Promethean types, but I don't think we're going to see any new species other than you know maybe precursors, but they've all been turned into flood. Um, if the flood do return in proper, we might see you know certain species that have been mutated by the flood. That would be interesting. Who know you know that's one way I could see that happening. Um, another one is perhaps there were oh, excuse me uh, covenant with non combat roles that we didn't get to see. So maybe there's some species still in the covenant that we haven't seen. Um, there was the species mentioned in Halo 2's Conversations of the Universe. Um, I think it was like the shark whale or something like that. Uh, I don't, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but, uh, you know, it'd be interesting if we could bring that one and make that canon. It was a, it was an enemy that was supposed to appear, appear in Halo 2. Actually, it was supposed to be in Halo 1 and originally, but it got pushed to Halo 2, but then it just never happened. Kind of like the Flood Juggernaut. Look that one up. But yeah. Uh, Ken Cook asks, what happened to the frigate over Algolus? It was gone by the time the UNSC Heart of Midlothian had arrived. This is an excellent question because I cannot find anything that actually explains this. Uh, I went back through Midnight at the Heart of Midlothian. I looked at um, um, Halo Legends, uh, the prototype, and neither of them you know, talks about what happened to the, to the frigate. Did, maybe it got destroyed. Um, it certainly never encountered the the same boarding party that uh, Midlothian encountered. Otherwise, what would be the point of boarding Midlothian? Because you know they were both out after nav data. So you know, unless the frigate you know caught wind and erased its nav data, and the boarding party just said, "Huh, let's destroy it anyway," because it's useless to us now. You know, the other the other thing, you know, this is kind of a long shot. Not that any of these aren't. Um, UNSC slip space drives have never been very accurate, so, you know, maybe it overshot it, maybe it undershot it, but, um, I don't know, there's nothing to, to say, there's, there's no, there's no clues to look into it, sorry. Uh, Pink Theory asks, my biggest question is why did Halsey's life depend on developing the Spartans? First strike, I think. Did her gay eye tell her to do it? If not hers, then who? I couldn't find anything that talked about Halsey's life actually depending on creating the Spartan 2s. I mean, there's plenty of stuff about her uh, or from her saying, you know, you know, it was uh, it's absolutely necessary to keep humanity alive as a species, you know, based on her own findings, based on the Carver study. Um, you can look this up on Halopedia, but it was originally mentioned in, um, I think, Fall of Reach and then expanded upon in Halsey's journal. I think it was Fall of Reach where it was first mentioned, but it might have been something else. Um, but it was at least expanded upon in Halsey's journal where, you know, this guy, Dr. Carver, he had this estimate for how long, you know, colonial stability would, would could, you know, for, you know, when colonial instability would happen and how many lives you could expect. And Halsey figured out that he had actually underestimated that by a lot. And made, long story, you know, rest of the story short, <laughs> shortened. Um, you could argue that this civil war, you know, the insurrection between the UNS, you know, could lead to human casualties rivaling those, account, you know, that occurred as a result of the human covenant war. So she certainly felt that the, the Spartans were necessary. And there's a lot of lines referencing that, that that's might be what you're thinking about. Um, as for her gay eye guiding her to the Spartans, absolutely, based on lines from the librarian in Halo four and uh, even when she meets up with librarian and spartan ops it seems you know that Catherine halsey was for lack of a better word destined to create the spartans to create cortana and to create and to create mjolnir 
Delino Martinez asked, big one, um, I do have one question concerning the origin of the flood. Back in the day before the third Forerunner book came out, it was said that the flood was a powdered biochemical weapon in a jar that was accidentally released, mixed with organic tissue, and bam, flood. Um, I do have to correct you on this. Um, what, what the first two Forerunner books essentially say is that the flood was originally found as this powder in these ancient ships, you know, by humans in San Shayum, ancient alliance, you know, ironic ancient alliance for the wind. Um, and they found that this powder was basically inert, except when it ex exposed to these favored pets called Feru, made them more um, docile, essentially. But over the centuries, they started getting more, very aggressive. They were getting these weird growths that they would eat off each other. And eventually this sickness started spreading to humans and Senshayum, and they started, you know, manifesting as we know, know the flood today, that, you know, as, their co as combat forms. Um, so, yeah. Um, after the book, it became canon that the flood were mutated remnants of the precursors. Isn't the flood the complete opposite of, the, of what the mantle of responsibility is about? My theory for this decision is such. The precursors created the forerunners. The, the precursors said they fucked it up and made ancient humans. After the forerunners uh, uh, drove the precursors nearly to extinction, a few remaining went into a deep hibernetic sleep and that they, would knew, knew, that they knew that it would mutate them into something horrible, the flood. The mantle says that the most advanced and powerful species has the responsibility to shelter all other races for growth and prosperity until another is deemed worthy to take the mantle. Whoever can defeat the flood uh, will be the rightful heir to the mantle, but still the creators of the mantle turn into the very things that destroys the mantle in order, pr in order to prove who is worthy of its inheritance is so still sounding a little weird. Thoughts? Oof. Well, technically you could argue that, and the flood certainly makes this argument, that the flood is the ultimate form of the mantle because you know once everything is absorbed, uh, all life is ultimately protected. All you know, all that mem all those memories, all that culture is preserved in the flood. Uh, all the bi biological uniqueness is preserved. You know, it can literally recreate uh, the species that you know that it absorbed. Granted, it, it, they're made entirely out of flood supercells, but. But so, you know, in addition to all this stuff being saved, uh, you know, all this culture being saved, the Flood represents an end to war and strife. So, in many, many ways, without having too much knowledge of exactly what the Mantle says, because we don't have a whole lot of, we don't have a whole lot of ideas, um, the Flood is the perfect form of the Mantle. And I just want to comment this bit. Uh, the mantle says that the most advanced race and po most advanced and powerful race has a responsibility to shelter all other races for growth. Um, at least that's more like the forerunner and specifically didact uh, take on the on the. Uh, I guess that's more like the forerunner take on what the mantle is. Is whatever testing criteria there were for the there was for the mantle. We don't know what it was prior to. Well. We don't know what it was at all, though it does kind of seem to, I will say, uh, I think it was Primordium seemed to imply that the Flood would be a test for humanity, though if they fail, they'll just become part of the Flood. Well, yeah, so weird, a lot of weird stuff going on, but, you know, this whole advanced and powerful race, that, that that's more the forerunner take on the mantle than the act, what the mantle actually is. And what it actually is, we still don't really, we don't truly know. We just know what the forerunners believe it to be. Anyway, I hope I, I hope through all that jumble I've accurately answered the question. Or at the very least gave you a sufficient answer. Uh, Sean Seely asks, uh, It does seem like 343 is building up Sarah Palmer to be a main character in future Halos, Spartan Ops, comics, and now Spartan Assault. Do you think that we will see a FPS base ar based around Sarah Palmer in the future? Sarah Palmer, not so much. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we've seen with her recently was just to explain her backstory. And while she is a main focus for a lot of stories, especially um, Escalation now, uh, you know, we do know that other characters are going to be focused on. We know um, Gabriel Thorne's going to show back up. If anyone's going to get a, if any, like, Spartan 4 is going to get their own spinoff game, or if there's going to be a Halo game that doesn't focus on the Chief, um, 
I think it would be one that focus. I think they'd focus on Spartan Thorn. I mean, the 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 Halo Four Limited Edition comes with blueprints of warrior armor that are labeled for Gabriel Thorn. Um, the Infinity Packet, you know, which has essentially the blueprints and all this information on on Infinity and the Spartan Four program, belongs to Gabriel Thorn. Um, so. If there's anyone that they're they're gonna, you know, make an FPS around, I, I would say Gabriel Thorne, and that I would absolutely love to see. If they're gonna, but if they do do Sarah Palmer, they really got to work on her character because I have not seen her very well received. But that's my bias. Uh, Thomas Connell asks, just curious, what is Red versus Blue Red versus Blue's place in canon? I seem to remember Bungie announcing it was canon a while ago. Now, I couldn't find anything about a Bungie announcing it as canon, but Rooster Teeth, the creators, uh, their stance is that uh, Red vs. Blue is not canon, um, and they don't want it to be because they they would feel too restricted. You know, They'd have to be careful about certain events and places, and I, they wouldn't be able to do as much as they can right now. So Red vs. Blue is not canon. So saith Rooster Teeth. Um, all right, fun time. Well, our last batch of questions come from a, a fan site called Halo Archive. I'm going to leave some links in the description below so you can check them out, and absolutely do check them out. You know, it's a great, it's one of those, it's a great Halo fan site. It's very small right now, so, but um, you know, their community is always growing, um, and a lot of members there are very knowledgeable of of the lore and and so and uh it's a great place so just check it out take my word for it um anyway questions what do you think are the chances what do you think the chances are of there being or what do you think the chances are of there being other races within the covenant that weren't mentioned because their duties aren't aren't fighting um i don't think it's very probable it is possible but not probable i just don't see it as likely to happen um, do you think we'll ever get clarification on Halo with Halo 3's events, such as the number of ships that are within the home fleet? I'm actually surprised this one wasn't answered in any of the visual guides we've gotten so far. You know, either the, the first one or the Halo 4 specific one. Um, but I would guess, if I were to guess, 500, maybe 1,000 ships, but who knows. Um, we certainly know it's more than 100. <laughs> um how were the SMACs still up? Um, well, considering there were 300 of them, I, I don't see it as impossible that a few would um, survive. Especially when you consider that the the single the single SMAC can take out a Covenant... Uh, what, what did they say? Um, it can take out a Covenant uh, capital ship in a single shot, so... It doesn't really... like Even if only 1% survived... Uh, of the original 300, that's still three, you know, eh, three of them at, at least, um, which, while it would take a while to, to reposition them over Earth, they could still do some serious damage. <laughs> um, how Arby and friends were able to get back to Earth, um, it would be nice to get an official confirmation, but the way I see it is they just hitched a rock, you know, they just took a, a, probably a smaller Covenant craft, I seem to remember something about them hitting a slip space wake, which accelerated their trip back home. But I couldn't. I need. I need to go back and actually see if I can find a source for that. So, don't take my word on that. Um, why the Why did the key ship wait over Mars instead of going directly to Earth, like we see at the end of Halo Two? Well, with Halo 2's ending, you know, the original ending for Halo Two was you'd go back to Earth as the chief and the art. The the um, what eventually just became like the the portal to the Ark was actually supposed to be the Ark. But, you know, when, when Halo 3 went in development, Bungie had to come up with all these new ideas. Basically, there was this big retcon in which, and you can go to, you can go to Halopedia, either the, 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 page, the page about the key ship itself or Truth, Truth's page. Yeah, Truth's page. <laughs> and they'll have a link to a Bungie weekly update, which basically explains why, the, you know, what the key ship was doing. It basically... You know, from high charity went to the to the soul system, but it came in pretty far out system, and you know, kind of went in at relativistic speeds for a while. 
then eventually it jumped further in system or I think it like pretty much it was pretty much going relativistic from you know the time it came in to pretty much Mars. So I don't know that it actually stopped over Mars, but it, it was going pretty slow for a while. And that's because they eventually they knew the chief was on board. You know the chief tried to kill Truth, but it didn't work out. So he was kind of running all over the ship trying to evade the Covenant. Um, if it did wait over Mars, my guess would be it has to do with the key of Usalon. Assuming I'm pronouncing I remember that correctly you know the thing uh Ackerson made up to you know save his brother and cleveland from getting killed by the covenant but you know basically after all that went down then it jumped in system and the chief signaled uh Ky um cairo station saying sir i'm gonna finish this fight yeah do you think it's possible do you think it's possible for the other contender class ai mentioned at the end of cryptum to appear possible yes probable I don't think so. Um, I don't know. I, I've always been of the mind that they probably that most of them probably got destroyed during the attack on the Citadel. Um, but don't get me wrong. I would absolutely love to see the Contender class AI show up. In, you know, other than mendicant bias, mostly I like. I want to know what offensive bias has been up to. I mean, my my you know top of the you know off the top of my head, my guess would be that. He's been with the surviving forerunners, well, the descendants of the surviving forerunners, you know, helping them out. But still, would love to know what's going on with it, with uh, that one. Who knows? Maybe the other contender class AI are with those surviving forerunners, and we might find out. Wild speculation. Um, how is it even feasible for humanity to become a galactic powerhouse after being nearly wiped out during the Human Covenant War? Humans went from being devastated to the top of the food chain in about four years. How did they get to the, the resources, manpower, etc., to rebuild exponentially uh, to something of an even greater caliber than their prime in the war? The way I see that is that they aren't actually as powerful as we perceive them because all our all our uh, all our media has focused on the Infinity, so which is the most powerful sh for all intents and purposes is the most powerful ship in active ship in the galaxy. Um, you know, it's it's certainly more powerful than anything the Covenant ever had, minus high charity, arguably. But um, anyway, so we just get this we just get this perceived illusion of of uh, of humanity being a powerhouse. Um, though you do raise an it does raise an interesting question: where do they get resources and manpower? Um, as for resources, now this dates back to like two thousand one, the Halo Xbox page and. While a lot of that um, information has since been de uh, declared non can or I don't know if it was ever declared, but it was certainly overwritten by newer canon, um, it did make mention of colonies that were completely automated. So no humans lived there, or there'd be you know limited human interaction at you know some points just to make sure the machines were working right. So you know they mine resources or. Um, food and whatnot, and then send out. I mean, we already know from contact harvest that ships can be sent completely, you know, you know, on complete, completely by automation. Not even a dumb AI, just like a simple computer program saying, you know, go from harvest to um, whatever planet once it's been loaded up. So um, that that at least for me would answer resources. Um, as for manpower, in a recent tweet. From 343 concerning like the the number of humans on Earth at the end of Halo 3, which was 20 million or sorry 200 million, um, they did talk about the fact that you know much of Earth's population was evacuated prior to the co the Covenant attack or you know during the Covenant attack. It wasn't exactly clear, and you know then later returned. And we of course also know that that at least we know of at least two colonies that went completely untouched during the war. And I think some of the a lot of the recent uh, Halo stories, like I think it, specifically there was like Palace Hotel, but um, other ones at least uh, talked about how there were at least like their humanity's overall numbers were still in the billions, even though most of the core worlds had still been had been uh, at least most of the outer colonies and most of the core worlds had been annihilated. We were still in the billion, you know, you know the billions of numbers, you know, low billions like ten or thirteen, but still billions. So, you know, that, that, that's the way I see it, I guess. <laughs> More about a perceived 
uh, we're more of a we just appear like a juggernaut, um, not so much that we actually are. You know, if we were to lose Infinity, I would imagine that humanity would be fucked. <laughs> anyway, seeing as the Prometheans are likely to be expanded upon, do you think Jewel will allow the Didact to compose his forces? Um, would Jewel allow it? I don't think so, if only because he actually knows that the Forerunners are not gods. You know, he is aware of the truth. Um, whereas all his forces, um, being from, I, I believe the planet was called Hesturos, the, or the, the Sanghili colony of Hesturos. Um, you know, they, they might allow themselves to be composed considering they don't actually know that, they, you know, they, they are still fervently believe that the Didact is a god. So, I don't think that Jewel would allow, but his forces might volunteer. Be an interesting plot point. Uh, let's see. Let's see where we're we. Why haven't the Co Why haven't the Covenant used the teleportation spires prior to or after the Battle of Reach? When did they get the teleportation technology? Well, we've seen plenty of teleportation technology see in multiplayer maps, and I know that's probably the weakest place I could try and derive canon from, but. Yeah, the teleportation technology itself is canon, so you could say that they've kind of always they've had it for a while, um, at least in su to some degree. Um, as for like why they didn't use the spires prior to or after Reach, the, those early days in the Battle of Reach, you know, prior to August thirtieth, that was a very or at the very least prior to. Um, I guess you could say August fifteenth or whatever. You know those when they around the time you know those early days in August, whatever, whatever you know, right up to the fourteenth. This reach was a very different invasion than you normally see the Covenant undertake. Uh, you know, normally they show up and just start wiping the shit out of out of whatever humans are there. Or, you know, out of the humans that are there. But with Reach, they you know they knew there were Forerunner artifacts there. They wanted to get access to them, and they so you know they had to do this kind of sort this sort of uh, secret invasion, so you know they were ferrying ground troops to the ground so that they could just so they could quickly move in infiltrate and take over, um, you know the sections of the planet that they wanted to to get to, maybe even you know get straight to the orbital batteries without any resistance kind of thing, so. You know, and and from from the size of those spires, you can tell that they take some time to set up. So that's why I don't, I think we don't really see them, because Reach was a very different type of invasion than we normally see. Uh, what was it? What was this? Ah, yes. How are humans able to understand the mechanics behind behind a Forerunner slip space drive, but not the plasma pistol or the portal? How are they even able to use a drive without understanding the depth of slip space and that it runs on a crystal? Um, basically, I don't think humans actually understand that. I credit everything to the Huragok. I mean, if humans understood anything about the Forerunner engines on Infinity or any of the other Forerunner tech they have in there, I think. You know, it, it would raise some serious questions about why Infinity was never used during the Battle of Earth. Um, but, you know, if, you know, they had these four slip slipspace drives that they could never get working until the Hurga came around, that would be a very easy way to, expl to explain that. And, honestly, that's that's the way I look at it. They they don't know. They don't actually know. They got the Hurga to kind of wire this stuff together. Um and that's and you know get it working but prior to that that kind of sort of thing as for the whole slip space flake bit um that is a really good question uh one way i could see it is maybe the hurgok knew a way to bypass because you know obviously human and covenant don't uh don't they their their slip space drives run on you know fusion and uh plasma power respectively so, you know, maybe the maybe the Hurgok were able to bypass the need for a crystal by plugging it into uh, Infinity's generator, uh, fusion generator, um, or maybe even there were some crystals on the for on the shield world, uh, the sharpened shield. I actually don't remember. I think it was what was it? Inst uh, shield world zero zero six, maybe. I don't remember. <laughs> Trevelyan. 
Clavelian or something like that. <laughs> I used to know how to pronounce it. But, you know, maybe there's some crystals there. You know, you'd want, if you're, if I were the Forerunners and, uh, you know, I had this bomb shelter, I'd want to be able to make sure that I had some cars that could run and, you know, I had some fuel to run my ships or whatever, you know. So they might have had some slip space flakes, which, again, would explain why Infinity wasn't used in the Battle of Earth. Um, how did the UNSC manage to infiltrate High Charity? We literally cannot think of how this could have been done. Um, the way I see it is this. You... You know, you only have one or two people, uh, you know, maybe four at max. Uh, you know, and if you can get aboard a Covenant ship undetected, you know, that we've seen from the games that Covenant do not Covenant ships do not have the greatest security. Um, so, you know, they could easily get in there, remain undetected until, you know, ch chances are they accidentally stumbled across high charity. But... You know, just, you know, stay hitting on that ship. Once they're at high charity, it would be, it, you know, there's, the place is so big. There's so, there'd be so many hiding places for a human to, to go to. And, I mean, the other, the other big, the other option I see is, you know, they could have paid off some jackals. You know, especially in post-war, we're seeing that humans in certain covenant are interacting, you know, pre, you know, they're, they're kind of okay with interacting, you know, on Venezia especially. But... So, you know, maybe they could have paid off some jackal, you know, they could have paid off some jackals for the information or a trip, you know, to high charity or, you know, some some easy access of sorts. Uh, that's the way I, that, that's, those are some ideas that come to mind. Uh, why is Maggie Peransky, tr um, why is Admiral Peransky trying to make Halsey seem like the devil despite approving the Spartan 3 programming and letting Reach fall? This is the question that takes the cake i have no goddamn idea for those who don't know uh admiral pransky who originally you know head of oni uh and one of the most powerful individuals uh or one of the most powerful humans alive at during her time you know she approved the original sperm program she and she approved the Spartan 3 program, which while they didn't kidnap kids, they were still using and augmenting kids, granted at a lower risk, but again, still using kids. And she basically decided to let Reach fall to for the for the sake of the up uh, for the sake of Operation Red Flag. Now yes, she you know, she's sacrificing lives for the greater good, but that's basically what the Spartan 2 program was as well. Um you know, Maggie or or Peransky is in no is in absolutely no position. As I said, actually, in my Mortal Dictata review, Peransky is in no position to make moral judgments about Halsey, considering her own checkered past, which is arguably worse. Actually, no, it isn't arguably worse. It is worse. She's the head of Oni. She's ordered people's deaths. Some of them were assholes, but not all of them. So I don't know why. I, the better question I think is why is why is three four three trying to make Halsey into the devil? And that I do not know. Frankie seems Frankie recently said that it's supposed to pay off for us soon, but oh, it better be a worthwhile payoff. That's about all I can say about that. Final question: What do you think Reach was for? To the Forerunners, what do you think is the story behind the massive Forerunner ship there? Um, I don't think that Reach was anything special. I know some have speculated since Cryptum came out, and I shared in this speculation, I must admit, that, you know, there, you know, slip space flakes come from this master crystal of sorts, the Master Emerald, <laughs> to make obscure Sonic references. Um, you know, maybe this is where it was stored and that's, that's might maybe that's what the, uh, the weird crystal that they found in first strike was, or at least it was a fragment of that. I certainly still believe that it was a, that it was a slip space flake or a slip space crystal of some sort, you know, used to power, uh, forerunner, forerunner ships. But anyway, um, I don't know if it, I don't know if it was anything special to them, but that that's one idea I know has gone around and I've shared it. Um, what do you think is the story behind the, the massive forerunner ship there? Uh, 
I don't think there's any real story there. You know, chances I, I would guess that it probably crashed or it was on reach and then, you know, over the centuries got buried by the ice. But I would I would probably guess that it crashed on reach. You know, maybe there were these forerunners out on Yeah, it comes to mind actually Imagine that maybe there were some forerunners on the on the front lines because I believe I don't know if it was ever confirmed. We know we know that Earth is outside the mag uh, the Maginosphere, so I would pro considering the proximity. I think it's like what is it? Reach is like ten light years from Earth, something like that. Um, yeah, something like that. It's 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 close. Yeah, ten light years, I believe. Um, you know, may you know? I would imagine that Reach was outside the Maginot Sphere, so maybe, uh, you know, some forerunner ship was out there fighting the flood, and when the halo array hit, it crashed on you know Reach's polar cap, and then the ship got buried by the ice. One way or another, either you know, be it that the ship was deliberately put there, or that it would it crashed at, for whatever reason, be it the result of the halo effect or something else, um, you know. It, it was oh, where was I going with that <laughs> I lost my train of thought um, anyway it was buried you know it was buried by the ice over the centuries it wasn't I don't think it was deliberately put that deep in the ice but it was just it just happened to be down that deep considering it, it was in the ice you know melting and refreezing and new layers of ice all that jazz <laughs> well that is it for our questions um, I want to thank everybody for submitting because these were all all of these were great questions um, I absolutely loved answering them doing the research to answer that to answer them accurately uh, so thank you all I hope I answered everything at you know at least adequately but I hope I gave uh, some substantial answers for all of you um, definitely got to do this again maybe when the next book comes out or uh, Definitely, at the very least, right before the next Halo game, what be that Halo 2 anniversary, which I still doubt, or Halo 5. But we are, we are getting a game this year, so definitely within you know the, the next six or seven months, got to do this again. Um, so thank you all. This has been Halo Cannon. See you next time.